Hello, let's talk about some exercises for MA modeling. The, if the general uh, structure and the general issues, the complicated issues of an MA model are really related to other issues we've already addressed, primarily valuation issues, getting depreciation right getting normalized cash flow right, all of these sorts of things. Uh, but M&A models can be kind of interesting to look at. They're not so complicated to uh, make. Some people get intimidated by them because they've never really looked at them. And then the investment banker looks so fancy with them all. But let, let's, let's, uh, we'll start with some simple NB, LBOs uh, models and then we'll talk about, well, how do you put, if you have company A and company B and then they com get combined, how do you compare a company, let's say company B is the acquiring company, how do you co compare company B to before the merger to company A combined with company B after the merger, and earnings per share and accretion and dilution and all that. And then we'll have some synergy exercises We'll talk about holding periods, pro forma balance sheets, uh, and some uh, optionality in, in uh, the analysis where you might have an earn out or some kind of management incentive. And the, the uh, cash flow waterfall might be a little bit tricky. So those are some of the issues. Um, this table will be changed as we, as we work through the things. Now the first one is our simple LBO model. If you want to find the simple LBO model, you go to uh, chapter one, M&A exercises and templates, and then you go to M&A exercises. And this is acquisition and LBO. So I don't know, maybe we'll do some of these other ones down here as well. Okay, this is the simple LBO. Uh, okay, fine. Why don't I look at this? I'm kind of wasting your time, but uh, uh, when you open this, it's one of these older models where I you know, put a little user form dot show at the beginning. Okay, and this is why I'm going to try to leave this one so you can press clear and compute yourself. So let's see. We start by having a summary of the transaction. And let's get just the EBITDA we have at the beginning. And then we say, well, how much debt are we going to issue in the transaction? Well, we have the debt to EBITDA, and we'll just multiply that by the EBITDA. And this is, I suppose, a key point is, is uh, what's the right level of debt to EBITDA and how to interpret that statistic. Now, this is an extraordinarily simple enterprise value calculation. We, of course, would have to net out the cash, the, all of the, um, oh, all, of, all of those uh, def uh, 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 derivative liabilities. We'd have to figure out what to do with other assets and all that. So in terms of the uses of funds, well, this is so easy because all we're doing is buying the company. When we're buying the company, we're saying, okay, I'm going to pay 6.5 uh, times the EBITDA. That's not very big. So this that'll be our uses of funds. Our sources of funds will be the debt we just had and the equity we issue for the transaction will be the difference. So really, in an acquisition, starting with the sources and uses is absolutely essential. Okay. And then for the debt schedule, I said, okay, let's put in the debt term. Oops, the debt term or something. Where did I put that in? Hang on. Well. Why this? Hang on just a minute. Oh, there's the debt term. Excuse me. You can see that I'm not being dishonest. I 
really have not looked at this exercise in years and years. And then we'll put the interest rate in. For some reason, did I put an interest rate in the first year? Okay. And I shift control, right arrow control R. I don't have the, uh, the other thing uh, done yet. So now we use the sources and uses just suppose this is a little bit analogous to project finance. You use the sources and uses to, to then compute the uh, things. And then you can press F4. Oops. Excuse me. Okay. And it looks like my F4 is not working. Ah. God. Okay, and then let's divide that by the debt term. And press the F4 again. Ah, maybe I was wrong. And then the remaining amount, I should be more enthusiastic about this. Oh, look, we got the debt schedule. Oh, that's so exciting. Okay, and then we can take the interest and Another issue really in these acquisition models would be the potential circular reference and what when I press shift control R I went crazy just now. Okay. But the if we use the average balance which we really should do, excuse me, when we're uh making an annual model it's, it's one thing to not use a average balance when you're making a monthly model or when you actually uh, make the other uh, when, when you're actually using a semi-annual model to represent the debt now we put EBITDA and CAPEX and then finally yeah what we of course should do is have a uh, switch in here. This is a very, very simple model. So we're just going to take the final EBITDA and multiply it by our exit uh, multiple. Uh, here we go. So we're going to assume a, 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 a constant uh, exit, which is really not correct because Oh, and I said, hang on, let me read what I said to do instead and put the correct one here. Okay, and that's the uh, exit multiple. And then we take our exit multiple and we multiply that by the, the uh, EBITDA. Okay. Finally, we can, can compute the depreciation. Now, the depreciation, this is, I'm going to, this is just disgusting. I'm going to, uh, where did I uh, put the, I suppose we, we're assuming that the purchase of the company is for, is this what I said? Uh, it, well, it comes from the pro pharma balance sheet, which I didn't compute, but the opening balance is equal to the closing balance. The capital expenditures come here, and the proceeds from the sale go, are, are uh, this one. Now, this is all not quite correct, but the most important thing to really emphasize here is that the uh, acquisition can be a tax-free uh, uh, transaction and then you don't have to worry a whole bunch about things if it's a taxable transaction you have to write up the assets and there can be some horrible kind of accounting treatments for the uh, uh, goodwill this would should have been adjusted for the cost base and there should have been a gain on the sale and all of that if we really were careful but if we assume that the buyer is going to also treat it as a tax-free exchange we don't have to worry very much about all of this so we put in a, a depreciation rate now that depreciation rate doesn't have retirements in so we have to be so very careful with that really uh, I feel a little guilty the way I did this without retirements it's about the and then let's start with zero and then 
just accumulate the depreciation. Okay. And finally, let's make the financial statements, which again are the, should be the easiest part almost once you've, you've got everything else done. We have the EBITDA, we have depreciation, we take the difference. We take the interest expense that we put in for our uh, paying for our uh, uh, transaction that gives us the EBITDA, EBIT. We put in, we take this and we multiply this by the uh, tax rate. Did I put a tax rate here? Yeah, oops. Okay. And uh, then we get our earnings. Okay. And then we're, then we're gonna keep going down. We'll take our EBITDA. Okay, we'll take our taxes that we really pay, assuming that those are real taxes. We'll put in our CapEx. And then don't forget to add in the, the terminal proceeds. And then we can get our cash flow after our capex plus the terminal proceeds. And then we can get the interest that we pay on our senior debt. Again, we've already done that. And that gives us our cash flow that we have available for repayment of the senior debt. This time we've put in a fixed repayment now we clearly really should have put a cash flow sweep in here. I can't believe that we really didn't. I think in the next exercise, we better have a cash flow sweep because what happened here? Oh, just a minute. Did it, is this really more? Did I put the repayment in? I think so. So what? We have negative dividends? That doesn't work. Okay. Oh. And then the cash flow to equity is what we get here. And then in the very first period, we put a negative amount and we get the amount we, uh, <sighs> amount we started with. I'm going to uh, obviously uh, look at what happened to the cash flow. But that comes from our sources and uses statement up above. Okay. And uh, then we're finished with the model. Just control right arrow, control R. And we can get our equity IRR. Okay. No, it's still very good. And I'm going to pause for a minute and see what happens. Okay, I guess uh, when I hit hit the button, uh, this one we used for the repayment, we used the minimum of the cash flow or 42, which was the repayments. But for that, we used 88. Here's what we should have done, I guess. We should have put a, a fixed repayment. Okay. Which is just the same as, as we computed before. This was just this number with the F4 key divided by the, the, the tenor of the debt with the F4 key. Okay. I don't understand why this didn't make a circular reference. Uh, this number repayments, that's fine. That comes from all the way down in the cash flow statement. That's the same general principle as we've been talking about for all the rest of it. Okay, and this one should have been, uh, this one should have been our minimum uh, repayment equal the minimum of either that number or the fixed level of the repayment. 
I suppose that's a little uh, fancy. Uh, that's not quite right either because if we kind of had a default, we'd have to have a repayment of the default. But oh well, that's the way I put it here. And then let's put the let's get the balance sheet done. Let's put the equity issued in here. And the opening balance equals the closing balance. That last thing was really kind of horrible. And let's put the earnings in. And, and please don't do that last thing. Oh, no, I'm realizing. I thought this was supposed to be such a simple one. Plus this, minus this. Okay. Shift control R. And we can just kind of put in our uh, assets. We're just assuming that the. Uh, uh, at plant assets are all this stuff. Okay, and then we put in our accumulated depreciation. Uh, that last thing kind of bothers me. Okay, and then we can alt equal that. And then we can finally put in our senior debt at the bottom which is our uh, from the debt schedule where's the debt schedule there it is okay and then the equity balance we can come put in from this one and we can select that and press alternate equal and let's see if our balance sheet balances. It looks okay. The difference is this minus this. And you know, of course, that that never happens. In oh, shit. Ah, okay. Look at my confidence. Oh, thank you. I, <clears throat> you know that I, of course, put the minus in for the accumulated depreciation. You must have just missed that. Okay, so this equals zero, and we are happy that our balance sheet balanced. Now, even though uh, there were some things that weren't so good about this exercise, you can say, "Oh, what if we pay eight times EBITDA?" I'm sorry, eight times EBITDA. What happens to the IRR? What happens if our multiple goes to six times? You can see that. Studying the multiples, that's the crucial part of this. Okay. What's the underlying growth cost of capital uh, uh, um, return kind of statistics in here? That's a subject for a whole other set of videos. That's really, really important. The structure of the model is essential that you start with the transaction, go to the sources and uses. Put the debt schedule and uh, some of the other stuff in before we do the financial statements. For the balance sheet, everything has to have a should have a closing balance, just like in all of our our other models. Okay, so that's the uh, exercise number one. I'm going to call this our simple LBO. And you can also see that our financing is going to be the maybe a little bit of the complicated area.